The first space-filling curve was constructed in 1890 by the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Peano. This was a curve which passed through every point in a square. The example is quite surprising because it seems impossible that a curve with no width could cover up a whole square. I can't draw this for you. Here's why. I'll prove that any reasonable curve of finite length can't possibly cover up an area. Suppose I have a curve like this of finite length. I could take a strip about it. The area of the strip is approximately its width times the length of the curve. It might be slightly less if there are overlaps. Reducing the width of the strip reduces the area proportionately. So I can make the area of the strip as small as I want. Since the curve is contained in the strip, it covers even less area. To a mathematician, a curve has no width at all and could lie inside every strip no matter how small. So its area must be zero. So how did Piano do it? He used a curve of infinite length. In my proof with the strips, I assumed that the curve had a finite number for a length which I could multiply by a small width to get a small area for the strip. This doesn't apply if the curve has infinite length. Here is Piano's curve. You can't see where the curve is going because the whole square is covered up. So this picture doesn't define the order of the points. To define the order, we can use what mathematicians call the method of successive approximations. A sequence of approximation curves is used to define a limit curve. We will start with some simple examples of limit curves, the circle and the snowflake curve. We will prove that the snowflake curve actually has infinite length. Then we will turn to space filling curves. For the circle, the first approximation is a triangle and the second is a hexagon. As we continue, we get more and more sides and the approximations get closer and closer to a circle. Let's pick a point on the first approximation and watch the path it traces. It approaches a point on the circle which we call its limit point. There are two conditions for a sequence of approximations to define a limit curve. First, every point on the first approximation must approach a limit point. The order of the points on the first approximation determines the order of the limit points. The second condition is that the set of limit points in this order must fit together to make a continuous curve, the limit curve. Here the limit curve is the circle. To get the snowflake curve, we start again with a triangle but change the other approximations. Let's watch again and study how the length changes. The first approximation is a triangle. Suppose its length is p. The second approximation, the star, is formed by pushing a small equilateral triangle out from the middle third of each side. 
Here is a side of the triangle. We can take the middle third of this side to make one new side of the star. For the other new side, we must add another third, making four thirds. The new shape is four thirds as long as the original side. Since each side of the triangle is replaced by a new shape which is four thirds as long, the perimeter of the star is four thirds the perimeter of the triangle. To get the next approximation, we again replace each side by a shape which is four thirds as long. The perimeter of this approximation is four thirds as long as that of the star. The perimeter of the next approximation is four thirds again as long. This is more than double the perimeter of the original triangle. The vertices of each approximation polygon lie on the limit curve and they are joined in the order they appear on the limit curve. So the limit curve is at least as long as each approximation. But the perimeters of the approximations more than double at every third step and there are infinitely many steps. Thus the total length of the limit curve, the snowflake curve, must be infinite. Do we really have a limit curve? To check this, we must watch a point move. The amount the point moves at each stage is governed by a geometric progression, and it approaches a limit point. Every point on the triangle approaches a limit point. So this example satisfies the first condition for a limit curve. The snowflake curve is defined to be the set of the limit points. Let's start over again on graph paper and watch the process more closely. If we enlarge the curve at the same rate as new sides are created, we get a repeating cycle. If we now stop enlarging, we can watch the curve move to the limit. The screen now shows only a small part of the snowflake curve. But even this piece contains infinitely many bumps and has infinite length. In fact, the piece of curve between any two points, no matter how close together, has infinite length for the same reason the length is multiplied by four-thirds infinitely many times. If we enlarge again, we can see more and more bumps. There are no straight or smooth pieces left. The curve appears the same no matter how close we look. It has infinite length, but still does not cover an area. That is, it is not space-filling. Infinite length is a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition for covering an area. Now let's look at space filling curves. We will start with an easy but incorrect example, which will turn out not to satisfy the first condition for a limit curve. Then we will look at a slight modification of Piano's original example. We will finish with the second curve, which also fills up a square. 
For covering the square, the simplest idea which comes to mind is a zigzag process. The lines in these approximations get closer and closer until they appear to cover the square. Does this sequence of approximations define a limit curve? To verify this, we must check that every point approaches a limit point. Let's watch this point. It is forever pushed all the way back and forth and never comes to rest. This point does not approach a limit point, so the successive approximations do not define a limit curve. To show that the first condition for a limit curve is not satisfied, we need only find one point which doesn't approach a limit point. The problem here is that the pushes stay large. To correct this, we change the approximation process. We first push horizontal zigzags. But next we push vertical zigzags, smaller ones. We repeat pushing even smaller horizontal zigzags. As we continue, the pushes get smaller and smaller. The square seems to be covered again. Do we have a limit curve this time? Let's watch this point move. Since the point moves one-third as far at each step, it approaches a limit point. After five steps, the point seems to come to rest and the square seems covered. But each approximation is again a polygon of finite length. So if we enlarge the picture while keeping the line width constant, spaces will appear. The point keeps moving at every stage and never comes to rest. However, a limit point is defined by the infinite sequence of approximation points. Like the snowflake curve, the limit curve has infinitely many bumps and appears the same no matter how close you get. Every point on the first approximation approaches a limit point. Note that the center of the square stays fixed and that two different points may have the same limit point. The limit curve, in this case the whole square, is the set of these limit points. The order of the points on the first approximation defines the order of the limit points in the square. Let's look more carefully at how the approximations are defined. The first approximation is a vertical segment in the middle of the square. We will add dots to show how the line stretches. Divide the square into nine smaller squares and push the line back and forth horizontally until it passes through the center of each of the smaller squares. 
Now divide each small square into nine pieces and push the line vertically back and forth until it passes through the center of each of the new squares. At each stage, we push one third as far as before, which is what makes the approximations approach a limit. We have seen that a curve of finite length cannot cover an area. Our limit curve, if it covers the square, should have infinite length. Does it? The first approximation is this vertical segment. If we turn it horizontally, and add two others of the same length, we can bend them until they form the second approximation. Thus, the second approximation is three times as long as the first. The next approximation is built from nine segments, so the length triples again. Since the length of the approximations triples at each stage, and their vertices are on the limit curve, the limit curve must have infinite length. There are many other curves which cover a square. Here is one given in 1912 by the Polish mathematician Václav Sierpinski. It's my favorite. Let's look at this again more carefully to see how the approximations are defined. The first approximation is a tilted square. The sides move out to form this octagon, the second approximation. Square projections form on the slanted sides of the octagon to make this cross-like shape as the third approximation. The motion from one approximation to the next follows a pattern. Whenever a square projection appears, it is pushed to an octagonal shape. And a shape like this is pushed to a new square projection. Here is the rest of the curve. To get the next approximation, each square shape is pushed again to an octagon. And shapes like this are pushed again to square projections. Here is the rest of the curve. The same process repeats over and over. Watch this point move.
it approaches a limit. Here are some more points. It can be proved that every point approaches a limit and that the limit points fit together to form a continuous curve. Thus the two conditions are satisfied and the approximations define a limit curve. Here are even more points. The limit points are well scattered on the square. In fact, every point in the square is on the limit curve. One proof of this, which we will not give here, is based on the fact that segments on the first approximation will move to fill up triangles. Note that four points come together at the center and that each side of a triangle is covered twice once by each color. We will close the film by looking at the approximation process again on graph paper. start to enlarge the picture so you can see that none of the approximations covers the square. Only the limit curve does. After we credit those who helped make this film, we will stop enlarging and you can imagine you are seeing a part of the limit curve.